Down at Boeing Plaza tonight, there is a very rare and significant aircraft. It is the Lockheed VC-121A Constellation, serial number 48613, known as Bataan. In 1948, the U.S. Air Force ordered 10 Lockheed Model L749 aircraft, the Graceful Constellation Airliner. They were delivered in 1948 and 1949 to Westover Air Force Base and the Atlantic Division of the Military Air Transport Command, MATS for short. Their Air Force designation was C-121A. One of the first major international crises of the Cold War began on June 24, 1948, when the Soviets closed all road, rail, and canal access to the parts of Berlin, Germany that were controlled by the Western Allies. The Berlin blockade left the people of West Berlin without their normal supplies of food, fuel, medicines, and other necessities. In response, the Western Allies organized the Berlin Airlift. Round-the-clock flights from England and the United States brought essential supplies to the people of West Berlin. The Lockheed Constellations, with their speed and long range, were ideal for moving supplies from the U.S. to Britain and to Germany during the Berlin Airlift. The Air Force's eight C-121As, also known as Connies, made continuous crossings of the Atlantic Ocean, flying over five million miles to help deliver relief to West Berlin. When the airlift ended, the Connies were converted from cargo planes to high-speed VIP transports for the U.S. Air Force. In 1950, during the Korean War, Connie number 613 became the flying command post of General Douglas MacArthur, who was at the time Supreme Commander of Allied Powers in Korea. MacArthur named his constellation Bataan, after the Philippine Peninsula, known for the infamous Bataan Death March of 1942, when 75,000 American and Filipino prisoners of war were brutally forced marched more than 60 miles to captivity in POW camps. Subjected by Imperial Japanese troops to hunger, thirst, beatings, torture, and wanton killing, more than 5,000 Filipinos and 500 Americans died or were killed during the eight days of the march. Many more would die in the POW camps of torture, starvation, or disease. In Korea, General MacArthur made 17 flights over the battlefields in his Connie, and she carried him to Wake Island for a meeting with U.S. President Harry Truman. On April 16, 1951, a fateful day for MacArthur, the Connie Bataan carried the general from Korea to Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, where President Truman relieved him of his command. MacArthur then flew home to San Francisco his last flight in the Connie. C-121A Bataan was assigned to the Pacific Air Command based in Hawaii. Her passengers included Generals Matthew Ridgway, Mark Clark, and Curtis LeMay, and South Korean President Singman Rhee. In 1953, Bataan carried newly elected U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower and Vice President Richard Nixon on an inspection tour of Korea. All C-121s, including Bataan, were removed from Air Force rolls in 1966 and sent to the Boneyard at davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona. Several were stripped of military gear and sold to civilian operators in Canada for use as fire bombers and bug sprayers. Three Connies, including number 613, Bataan, were assigned to NASA for use during the Apollo space program. When the Apollo space program ended, NASA 422 was acquired by the Army Aviation Museum at Fort Rucker in Alabama and put on display out in the open, and there she sat for 20 years. 
Officials at Fort Rucker considered scrapping Bataan in 1993 until Ed Maloney, founder of the Plains of Fame Museum in Chino, California, offered to take possession of her. That's a historic airplane, he told skeptical Steve Hinton, president of Plains of Fame. We've got to find a way to do it. Planes of Fame traded a helicopter for the Connie, made her airworthy with help from Lockheed, repainted her in General MacArthur's colors, and took her on the airshow circuit. But flying her was costly, and after one year on the circuit, Batan was grounded once again, perhaps permanently. Enter Rod Lewis, well-known aircraft collector and owner of Lewis Air Legends and the Air Legends Foundation. Lewis purchased Bataan in 2015 and hired Steve Hinton's Fighter Rebuilders Company to undertake Bataan's complete restoration. Finding parts wasn't easy and few people knew anything about the 1950s era airliner. Making Bataan flyable again was, said Hinton, like restoring 10 or 15 Mustangs. But despite the difficulties, Bataan once again took to the air on June 20th of this year, just in time for the trip to Oshkosh. She proudly wears the colors of General MacArthur's transport and will soon be given an all new, historically correct interior. Lewis plans to fly Bataan to events around the U.S. and maybe Europe and beyond. So Bataan will be seen and appreciated by thousands thanks to Ed Maloney's vision to save her from scrappers and Rob Lewis's dream to bring this beautiful and historic airplane back to life. Okay, now, now you've heard the recorded history of uh, Bataan. So, gentlemen, Rod, would you join me here, please? Sure, sure. Thank you. Which seat? Uh, oh, yeah. How about this one right here for okay. you, Rod? Okay. Sounds good. Does that put you, or would you rather be here in the shade? No. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm fine. All right. Thank you. Steve, if you'll sit next to Rod, and uh, we'll put um, Stuart on the end. Okay. That's a good place for you, isn't it? Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, honored to be here with these three gentlemen, Rod Lewis, Steve Hinton, and Stuart Dawson. They represent the Warbird community, uh, and the um, professionals, the uh, dedicated people who, who have done so much for all of the Warbird aircraft, and now we have this uh, Bataan. So, Rod, tell me... Um, what possessed you to think that you uh, wanted to restore something of this uh, major undertaking? You know, Connie, um, I'm honored here, first of all, to, to be here with, with my teammates to uh, represent, you know, our, our airplane that's supposed to be here, should be here tomorrow, uh, and your namesake. Uh, but I think what, I asked that question many times, actually, what possessed me to do this? <laughs> I think uh, it started probably in 2012. Uh, Steve and I made a trip over to the Ukraine, and we were looking for a large project. And in, in this case, it was a TU-95 Bear. And we went over there, checked it out. It was not nothing like we were told. Hadn't been flown in 10 years. We, we were told it was started up every three months. And so we got pretty discouraged after that, came home, and I, and I asked Steve, what, what can we do that's a big project that we can enjoy as we, we get older and we can fly as a crew? And uh, Steve came up with an idea that at, at his museum in uh, Arizona that they had a Connie. So it just started from there, and Steve, you can pick it up and that is a, a big, little more. That is a big project. Uh, <laughs> and uh, let me do just a little production here. If you guys would like to be in the shade, you could move your chairs up just a little bit uh, if you'd like, and you'll be in the shadow of this beautiful Corsair that also happens to belong to Rod Lewis. But that just keeps you guys out oh, of the yeah, sun a little better. bit. So uh, that makes a no, much better, huh? You okay? Okay. 
Well, Rod's just going to leave you guys over there completely. So, uh, it's, uh, okay. So, uh, Steve. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Steve, tell us uh, about the project. The beginning with Ed Maloney, uh, with his vision, was amazing. Well, it, it's kind of a funny story. You know, for the air race game, we're friends with the Wiley Sanders group out of Troy, Alabama. There, and one day I got a phone call at the shop that. Uh, from his guys said, uh, you know what, Fort Rucker has this constellation sitting there and, um, you know, it's probably available if you guys want it. You know, you're a museum and all and we know you. And, and uh, so I said, oh, I don't think so. I mean, we, we, you know, we're strapped just taking care of what we have. But anyway, I uh, mentioned it to Ed Maloney the next day and Ed just like, he stood up and said, really? He said, we got to get that airplane. And I was like, uh, well, Ed, we can't afford to put that together. He says, we'll find a way. So anyway against, uh, I, I wasn't you know, too convincing to talk him out of it, but uh, God bless Ed for that. And uh, that's what we did. And, we, and it turned out it, it, it kind of unfolded because as uh, we made a trade for it and we got it, and it just happened to be a retired vice president from Lockheed who lived uh, in Ontario, California, north of Chino, heard that we had it. And he was actually a crew chief on the airplane when MacArthur had it. <clears throat> and so he through his connections at Lockheed, uh, organized uh, some restoration, and we, we flew it to Dothan. Uh, well, we sent our guys uh, there for about five or six months to get it flying. It hadn't flown in almost 20 years. And uh, put a crew together and flew it over to Dothan, and Dothan uh, stripped all the NASA paint off of it and put it in MacArthur's markings, and then, uh, um, it, then it went to Addison, Texas, and they put an interior, a replica of the MacArthur interior in it, and then came to Chino. Uh, so uh, we operated it for uh, several air shows, but it just was very evident we could either fly the Connie or fly about 10 or 12 of the other airplanes. You know, that's what it would take to really maintain it correctly. So we ended up taking it out to our museum out in Arizona and put it on display. You know, it's a desert. It's a good place for an airplane like that, and then right on the highway and all. And then, uh, like Rod had mentioned, uh, our conversations and uh, we, you know, an aviation museum that we are, you know, we're, we, we don't have excess funds, but uh, Rod seemed kind of interested and uh, uh, Rod went and looked at it and we figured, well, it'd be worth our time and uh, Rod said he was willing to uh, commit to it. And uh, Rod is the hero in all this airplane, by the way. We did the work, but Rod was the one who st stuck it out. Uh, you imagine uh, funding... Uh, a restoration shop for eight years doing a constellation and it's it's you know we went through the whole airplane we you know rewired it well we took everything out of it first you know we had the outer wings off we had the landing gear out of it we had all the engines off and and uh and went through an eight-year process getting it all back together and uh real happy with where we are right now so it uh we're anxious to get it here so you can all see it well, it's, uh, it's certainly from the, the pictures, I know everyone is uh, really looking forward to seeing it because it, uh, it is beautiful. Uh, so, um, Stuart, <clears throat> you have the uh, pleasure of uh, flying it. Uh, so tell us a little bit, uh, I know you fly a lot of airplanes, so how does the, uh, the uh, Bataan compare? Well, uh, or does it? I flew a lot of forage and stuff hauling freight you know, early in my life. And, uh, but I never had a hold of a Connie. And it is amazing what that airplane will do. It, uh, it really will, will get on down the road. It, it runs fast. Um, it, it, uh, it's a little bit heavy to fly, but uh, that's uh, hydraulics from the 40s, you know. That's the way it was. I believe the airplane, speaking of fast, I believe it set a few speed records in its day, and it really is uh, ahead of its time as far as when it was designed and when it was used. Yeah. This this thing, if you fill it up, you can run 20 hours on it. I don't think we <laughs> Don't sign me up, right? <laughs> uh, and you really don't want to fill it up. No, you don't want to pay that bill. No, I don't want to pay that bill either. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that anybody would. Uh, so, Rod, tell me. Uh, I mean, I know you're disappointed the airplane is not here today, uh, but it will be here tomorrow. Uh, they, they had a, a little uh, hiccup. I think Bernie called that a hiccup earlier today in one of their airplanes. So you do have hiccups with these old airplanes. So um, you have to be extremely proud that this project has uh, come to fruition. 
Well, thank you. It's not complete yet. As mentioned in the, in the video, we don't have a complete interior, but as soon as the interior gets finished, it, it should be a really, really nice airplane. It is already. And proof of that it does fly, a video. So, yeah, video. so we've got, um, first of all, I'm, I'm not the hero. These guys that worked eight and a half years, we worked eight months just to get it airworthy, to fly it from Arizona to Chino. And those guys were super dedicated every day working on this airplane. Got it to Chino and then eight years, some eight years later, uh, we, we, June 20th, we finally got to, to, to fly it for the first time. I was in a, in a chase plane and a lot of those videos were, were from, from that day. But um, I, I, I'm very proud of mainly the team that's put this all together. And, and them sticking with it, because it was, uh, there were some hard times, especially during COVID. Couldn't get parts, couldn't get people. You know, it was just very tough, and it, it went right through COVID. Uh, Steve did all he could to just keep it running, you know. So I want to thank them. Well, yeah, and, and you know, guys, we, we should you know. all, you know, in, any of us who fly airplanes, we don't recognize the crew chiefs and the maintenance people often enough, but uh, they're the guys that, uh, that keep us going. And, of course, Steve does all of it with, the, with his team. How many people do you have working there in Chino, or do well, you know? Uh, it, it goes up. We, we always have a, around 10 to 14, kind of, right? But we had at times we had 14 people working on this, you could imagine. You know, when you... You drill skins off, and you, you're removing parts and cleaning parts and looking for parts, and it really goes on and on and on. Um, vintage V12, sorry, vintage radials, excuse me. Uh, Mike Nixon did the engines for us, mm -hmm. and they're a, a hybrid engine. Uh, they used a, uh, a power case and nose case off of uh, the latest turbo compounded 3350 and put it on the early blower so it all fit in the same cowling and the same engine mount. And... Uh, you know, we just have a lot of experience through the years, and we found ways to make it happen. We uh, modified the electrical system. You can imagine the 1940s, electro, 50s electrical system. It, uh, there were wires. I mean, a thousand pounds of wires going through that thing, you know, because it was pressurized and heated and air conditioned and, and, and of that era. And we made it more like a warbird. We wanted to make it as simple as we could so we could maintain it. So it's, uh, we're real proud of what we've done. And when you see it, you'll, you'll, you'll agree it's yeah. a really, Really nice detailed airplane, and uh, we another thing too. We got to match the rest of Rod's airplanes. You know, when you know Rod, every one of Rod's planes is a is a gem, and we just want to make sure that we keep that. <coughs> well, there's for Rod. Well, they you're right. You, you have a high standard here uh, mm -hmm. with the Lewis collection uh, to to live up to. Uh, that's so. If I understood you correctly, these engines are for this airplane. They are specific. To um, this constellation. Yeah, but I mean, they're the parts that are available, and it's not a major change in any way. The same, we use the reduced power settings that were uh, assigned to that earlier engine. Um, it's still a 2,500 horsepower engine, but the parts are a 3,500 horsepower engine. So they're the very latest evolution of that right cyclone 3350. And um, uh, finished radials has the largest uh, inventory of that. Uh, Part of our deal with him is his, he would use as many new parts as he could, and uh, most of the engines have all new, you know, cranks, rods, cylinders, and cases. They're like new stuff. It really is, and it uh, it's really clean. It uh, doesn't drip much oil. And we're used no. to working with 3350s on Sky Raiders that are always oily and spitting everywhere. You see in the in the, uh, the video there when it starts up, it looks kind of like a. It just spits smoke out. It doesn't even spit oil out. We're really impressed with it. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's cool. As you say, radials. If it has any oil in it, you're going to see some of that oil coming it's got out. Fifty some, gallon it oil. You better tanks. see some out. You better, <laughs> better see some it, come it, out. It better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, Stu. Tell us uh, again your impression of uh, the engines, the operation of the airplane. Uh, um, so, what's different? Uh, about operating this airplane, say, than uh, a, a single-engine airplane with this basic same engine? Well, we've got four of them to you take got four care of. Them. of. Yeah, yeah, all right. And um, it takes three people to fly this airplane, a pilot, co-pilot, and then you've got an engineer. And the engineer basically <clears throat> operates everything. You start and initiate what we're doing, like takeoff power, and he sets it. And 
<clears throat> anything you want and you need, you just tell the engineer and they'll do it. So it's really, you got to get coordinated. Everybody's got to work together on this thing. Well, that's what it's, it's very important. You call for the power and the You engineer call for what you want and he will give it to you. So is your engineer, no, I'm sure your engineer is still over uh, with the airplane probably. Yeah, he's still with the airplane. So we can say thank you to him because he, he's probably the most important part of this. Uh, they're this they're working here. real hard. Yeah, uh, so um, that that's really good. Uh, Steve, would... You make a shout out to uh, anyone else here in the audience or any of your crew who made this possible. What was what was a high point and a low point in this eight year restoration? Well, um, when you say a high point, well, when, when uh, Stu and I shoved the throttles up for takeoff and we both looked at each other, boy, this thing goes. We, you know, it hit a hundred <laughs> knots and fifteen hundred feet. We were kind of okay, let's go. You know, it it was really surprising, but we were fifty thousand pounds below gross weight, so that's part of it. But um, it, uh, that that was the, probably the high point of uh, you know the whole thing coming together and we finally flying the airplane. And like Rod said, the low point there during the COVID years, uh, you know everybody is struggling and and uh, uh, you know there was we were down about it, but uh, we we all stuck with it and uh, but it, it, we had so much enthusiasm with the, with the people that uh, we were doing business with. You know everybody was excited about being involved with the constellation. So. Wow. Sure, yeah. and it and it is gorgeous. So, who polished this airplane? Um, there was a company that was hired to do it, and uh, they polished. There was nine people on it for eight weeks, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was done there at Chino, and they made a big, giant mess. It was just a, that fuzz going everywhere. But uh, and they were every day black face, you know, from all the polish. But they were smiling, you know. It, it, everybody loved working on it. It really did. Well, yeah, yeah, that uh, that's a big. Pr I mean, you can polish a prop and be worn out, you know, if you're uh, one individual. So I can see where you hire somebody. Yeah, when so, Rod came up with a paint job, he's got oh, polish, ooh, ooh, ooh. ooh but ooh. I'm glad he did because <laughs> it really makes the airplane. It's it's you know it's it's beautiful. So, okay, Rod, tell us. I mean, we covered a lot of the history of the airplane uh, in the video, but tell us what part of the history means the most to you or, or led you to uh, make sure you replicated the uh, MacArthur years? I think just basically that it was MacArthur's kind of office in the sky, you know, and uh, it, it flew to many different important areas of the world. And um, I think that's, I just wanted to make sure that we were representing MacArthur properly and um, just wanted to just like it was or better, so. Well, and, that, and that's what, you know, we, we do here in More Words in Review, it's uh, history, heritage, and the heroes, yeah. and you certainly helped us on many occasions to present that and record this for generations to come so that they'll know what, what these airplanes did and what they meant. Uh, and so, okay, so tell me a little bit about this airplane uh, while we have it sitting here. We don't want to just ignore it. I mean, it's pretty <laughs> nice too. You know? Well, thank you. Yeah, it's one of the first four birds that I bought. I think uh, I, I had to buy this to get a to get a uh, a Bearcat, so I bought a Dash One Bearcat with this. Uh, probably in uh, boy, that was 20, 20 years ago. So um, I'd always wanted a Corsair, always wanted a Bearcat, so the package deal was just perfect. Perfect. So, so what was your first Warbird? First Warbird was actually a T twenty eight C. And I flew that for many years, bought that in 1994, and brought it to Oshkosh, did, did some work on it, brought it to Oshkosh, and it won Best, best T-28 in 1995. And then my second Warbird was a Whirlaway to get some tail tailwheel time. And that was a beautiful airplane. George Baker out of Florida built that one. And uh, just loved flying that, and then kind of, my next one was an NA-50, and then uh, I guess the following was a Mustang. Then I got, finally got to a Mustang, so. Okay, Stuart, what was the first uh, Warbird, or what was the first airplane that you flew at what age? Uh, <clears throat> I went to the airport when I was 16 because I had to have a job. I couldn't put gas in my car, and I never left. I just stayed there, and uh, I worked there uh, doing the line and fueling airplanes and learned how to fly. 
and just never went up, you know, never stopped. You never grew up. I never grew up. Never grew up. <laughs> That's a good thing. Don't want to. Yeah, Steve, you know, we, we've heard over the years the Chino the Chino boys or the Ed Maloney guys. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about the history of Chino and Ed Maloney and you guys that, that were. <clears throat> Excuse me, when I was in second grade, uh, when the nun left the, the, I tell everybody, when the nun leaves, right, you go in the chalk bar, you, you start drawing airplanes, right? But there was a mm -hmm. kid on the third row over from me that could draw better airplanes than I could, and that was Jim Maloney. That was Ed's son and my wife's father, so. And uh, at a young age, I just had the opportunity. Ed opened the door for Jim and I to, uh, you know, be part of the museum. And, uh, uh, you know, when you're eight or nine years old and hanging around the museum, all you're doing is, you know, causing problems for the people that are serious about it. But you grow up and a lot of great mentors. I actually got a late start flying. Uh, I was 15 the first time I ever left the flying in an airplane, ever flew in an airplane. But uh, yeah, yeah, like three, four years later, I found a Mustang. So, And the first time I came to Oshkosh was 50 years ago. Wow. Yeah, I brought uh, P-51 here, Leroy Pennell's Mustang, and then Jim was flying the museum's Hellcat. So. No, I'm not going to count. When 73. The first time. <laughs> 1973. 19, well, you're, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's pretty impressive. And mm -hmm. you've been here most, a lot of, a lot yeah, of the probably years. Probably majority of the times, yeah. yeah majority yeah, so. of the times. Well, first time I ever got paid to fly an airplane, I got flying an F-86 for Bob Hoover. In 1974, I brought an F-86, or, yeah, that white one with the red stripe. If you ever see an old picture with a, with a kid that, uh, working on it, that was me. All right. Well, Bob, Bob Hoover uh, was a mentor for a lot of people and uh, had a lot of good words of wisdom. And, uh, you know, it was uh, it was uh, really neat to know some of these people. And that's what we're, we're glad we've preserved, you know, their history and their stories here. And uh, now we carry on with the airplanes. And uh, tomorrow we're going to see a lot of the Corsairs out here. I asked Rod earlier. Uh, I don't know. The question was kind of like, why, why did you, why is the Corsair here? And he said, because you asked me to bring it, you know. So, okay. <laughs> so uh, what can we look for next year, Rod? Uh, I don't know how you top a constellation. Well, next, though. Year, next year we'll have a full-blown completed Connie, first oh, of all. Yeah, with interior. Yeah, in with it. an interior in it, with uh, 24 seats, actually. So, um, I don't know. Depends on what you're doing next year and what you need. That's <laughs> what I asked for. I have to be careful <laughs> what you right. asked for. Here. Uh, okay, so um, we're, this is going to be a, a shorter than normal uh, Warbridge Review because it is the afternoon. And uh, we're, they're going to start the night show here in uh, just a little, little while. But uh, would you guys be open to offering it out for questions if we have anybody uh, who sure. uh, has a question out there? Uh, sure. We can uh, we take this. I don't know if that I have my mic handlers yet, but maybe uh, maybe if you raise your hand, I can walk over and uh, there you go, a close one. That's good. <laughs> okay. Is there a time for it to arrive tomorrow? Is there a time for it to arrive tomorrow? Hopefully, it's going to be in the morning. We're waiting and we're coordinating this with uh, the people who, where the aircraft is now, but <clears throat> it's up and. Um, we're going to get over as quick as we can to get it back here. Okay, this gentleman. I'm a young Warbird buff. I love it. And how do you recommend a young person get into Warbirds? Steve, you're probably the one. To you got to make yourself available. And, uh, okay, you start at the bottom. I mean, you meet people and uh, offer to help and, you know, find somebody you're comfortable with, some group you're comfortable with. It's a... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of great people right here in this audience, too. You could probably uh, make a nuisance of yourself and get in somehow. Okay. This is Mike Live. Okay. Is yes, I was going to ask that in the movie The Aviator, they happened to have the Connie that, and they were talking about having the births. And so I wanted to know, is it going to be buttons or snaps? <laughs> <laughs> don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, and, and while we're waiting for the next uh, question, I, I think we recognize Steve. Uh, in the morning, we're going to have uh, Adam Makos here for uh, devotion uh, with the Corsairs. And Steve had a lot to do with the uh, devotion movie. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, we, are, are you planning a movie with a constellation with the Bataan, you think? Or uh, uh, let's write a script, huh? Yeah. Maybe, no, we should, sorry. maybe we should. Yeah, maybe we should. Let's uh, do it. 
Hey, you haven't done that yet, have you? Doing movies? No, no hey, that's, that's not for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, Devotion was a great project. You know, we got a phone call, and uh, Fred Smith from FedEx wanted to come out and talk about Devotion with his two daughters. They have a production company called Black Label. And so uh, Fred shows up with his two daughters. I mean, they're regular company, but anyway, uh, uh, he wanted to talk about doing this movie. He says, it's a great book, and my wife Karen had read the book, and she says, she was so excited about it because you know, it's a best-selling book, and you know, it's a great story. Um, funny part, uh, we talked a little bit in the office, and, uh, and then started, uh, I took Fred and his, uh, the people for a tour, and went through the first, our first hangar, and talked about the airplanes, and uh, Fred, Fred Smith, everybody knows who he is, right? FedEx. He's the fellow that started FedEx. Anyway, he looked out there, and we have an OV-1 in the corner outside. Hey, oh, I used to work on those things. Anyway, for the next 45 minutes, he gave the tour at the museum. He knew every airplane we had. I, I couldn't believe it. He was just talk, 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 mm -hmm. talk. Quite a personality. But a year later, um, Kevin LaRosa Jr., who you've probably met, uh, um, who's a, a, a young... Uh, aerial director now, an outstanding person and very accomplished uh, aviator as well. You know, he was assigned as aerial coordinator on the show, and so we sat down and figured out, uh, you know, first of all, what's the budget? You know, uh, the, you know, it could go on and on. Yeah, you start with uh, several people that are here. We even talked to them about using our airplanes, but then, of course, they narrow it down. But we ended up with uh, three Corsairs that we used for the whole show. Uh, we started in Wenatchee, Washington, Korea. Uh, did a lot of flying there. We were we were there um, at the airport for <clears throat> Wenatchee. I think we were there for about five weeks. I think um, you know some days it was snowing, couldn't do it. Some days we you know it was a nice day, or we just bared down and did it. And we had the Corsairs and um, had a Sky Raider from Ericsson. So we had uh, Ericsson's Corsair, Ericsson Sky Raider. We had our museum F4U1. Uh, Dan Freakens F4U4, and then we brought our MiG-15 up there too to do some scenes. And then uh, from there we went to Pasco, Washington, and uh, did all that stuff. If you watch the movie around the, the uh, river and the lake, uh, did it there. And then we took a break for a little while and uh, got the Bearcats and uh, Rod Sea Fury, <clears throat> and we went to Savannah with the Corsairs, and we based out of Savannah. And uh, we set up Rod Sea Fury. He has a two-place Sea Fury. Took the instrument panel out of the back and uh, painted the tail blue, and we put the actors in the back of the uh, Sea Fury. And uh, John Maloney and I did the Bearcat scenes. Uh, if you see the movie, some of the best Bearcat stuff you'll see. Anyway, mm -hmm. we did so much stuff, and of course, they only used five minutes, but we had a ball. You know, when you're doing a movie, you get to do stuff that's way, you know, kind of usually illegal, but you got a waiver to do. But buzzing the beach and looping and rolling and formation rolls and stuff like that. They used a few little things, but uh, it was a, a real great experience and uh, it was great uh, income for the museum and, uh, you know, all our guys were working on it. It was a great show and Rod let us take some vacation away from the county for a couple months. That was, that was a big deal. But uh, it was a good movie and uh, unfortunately it has a really sad ending, but um, uh, we were real proud of it. Well, I think we can all be proud of the uh, the integrity of uh, the uh, the people like you know Jesse Brown and uh, Tom Hudner, who uh, who are uh, veterans and uh, fly for their buddies. That's what Bud Anderson says. You know, I was flying for my buddies, and uh, a lot of them didn't come home. So uh, to our veterans, we owe a, a great debt, and to you guys. And and I wanted to bring that in for the interaction and the. The connections of all the Warbird people. I see the uh, Warbird people out here who also operate these airplanes. It's a very close knit community, and um, you know everybody is. Warbirds is a little different because we are here to showcase the airplanes in tribute to uh, all the people who served. And um, I, I know we have a, a. Oh, do I have to go to that question now? Mr. Roush has a question. I'm sorry, you're trumped, Mr. Roush. <laughs> I want to make a statement about uh, the museum that uh, my first contact with it. I started drag racing na nationally in 76, and the first time I uh, hit uh, the West Coast, I was at Pomona, and uh, they had uh, the, the, the Hellcat uh, on the display at the, at, the, at the grandstands, which was uh, piqued my interest. 
And I went looking for the museum after practice one day, and uh, I went to uh, found Chino, and uh, the B-17 was outside. And uh, do you still have the same B-17? Same one, yeah. I uh, asked if I could go through it, and uh, the person I was talking to, uh, whose name I, I, I never knew, said I could, but I had to leave a $5 uh, uh, contribution for the museum. So I got my $5 down, and uh, he uh, opened up the B-17, and I went through it for about 30 minutes, and uh, really enjoyed uh, my first uh, trip to, uh, to California, my first visit uh, to an aircraft museum, and my first exposure to Chino. Thanks, guys. You Thank have a you. lot of people that come to your community first mm -hmm. and uh, wind up in your museum, and uh, if you're still doing what you did in those days, you're making the hits with the people that, uh, that are impressed by it. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Jack. Yeah, these these museums throughout the country uh, are are just so valuable. And I'm, I see Ron Fagan sitting right there. They have an amazing museum in Granite Falls, as do many many of the people here have the aircraft in the museums. And uh, the question there, uh, Mary, I think you have a gentleman that would like to ask a question. Yes, I have uh, one question. Connie, I think, knows where I'm going to go with this. but the uh, And this is directed primarily to Rod, I think. And it's not so much as a question as an observation. Um, and, and we talked of the mission of uh, the C-121. Um, and, and the Navy flew it also, of course. And I was privy to watching the film and when it was retired, et cetera. And uh, I was I, I was kind of surprised when they said 1966. I think it was retired from the inventory. And I looked at Connie and I said, "Well, I, I said uh, there's there's another variant out there that flew a lot longer than that. In fact, in the Navy, it truly flew longer than that. Um, but uh, I was I was stationed in uh, in Keflavik Naval Air Station in Iceland, and I was flying Phantoms at the time. And uh, for early warning." What do I see sitting on the ramp but a 121? Of course, it was a little bit different. It had an EC before it, and it had the hump on the back, and it had the dish on the bottom, and that was our early warning. Um, that was like 1978, I do believe. And a lot of people here don't probably realize that that is truly a warbird version, and it was utilized a great deal in Vietnam also, again, for early warning. And of course, you know, it was replaced by, by AWACS, and the Navy had some e, you know, E2s that were used also. But uh, I think it's important to note that, uh, yeah, that, that truly is a, a warbird variant. And, uh, and really, it, it helped me. As a, as a Phantom guy, my radar would only look so far, you know. And then these, uh, their call sign was Adola. The Adola guys would start talking to us, and they go, hey. And we were intercepting bear bombers at the time. And here are these bear bombers way out there, and they knew it. We didn't, you know. They got us close, and we said, okay, we got it now, and off we went. But, uh, but yeah, I thank you also for the, uh, the restoration, for bringing it to note. Um, but I think it is also important that uh, people realize that, hey, this thing with a great big hump on the back and a dish on the bottom really helped out a lot of us fighter pilots uh, all the way through about 1978, I want to say. Well, that's great to know. Thank you. And, and your, your airplane, uh, it, it served in Vietnam with transporting uh, people uh, who uh, were a very important part of that. Uh, so, so Rod, uh, if we, uh, did I have another question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, young man, up top. First, I just want to say thank you to everyone here and everyone that's not here for bringing the Constellation. That's always been one of those iconic, legendary aircraft that I never thought I'd get a chance to see fly. And looks like tomorrow's going to be that day. So sorry if I sound like a kid in the candy store because that's exactly what I am. <laughs> um, but to piggyback off the first question, as far as leaving during one of the air shows, is that still planned for Friday or you're doing Saturday or is that kind of fluid right now? Because I'm leaving Sunday, so I was hoping to catch it on one of those two days. I do do you still think, are you leaving Friday or do you know? Excuse me. Rod, Rod can tell you um, that. Probably since we're arriving so late, we're thinking about Saturday departure. Actually, yeah. we're we're looking yeah. for donations to fill it up with fuel. Yeah, exactly. so, no, I'm kidding. No, well, we'll I stay, am, we'll stay totally, a lot longer. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. So yeah. along those lines, how much fuel does this airplane hold? I'm talking gallons, not dollars in today's dollars. 965 gallons. I'm sorry, I stepped in. You say that about seventy-five thousand dollars worth. No, it's fifty-nine hundred right. gallons. Yeah. Yeah, six thousand yeah. gallons. And per you're long. burning how much per hour? Well, it depends on where the throttles are. But uh, mm -hmm. flying here, we were a hundred gallons an hour. Hundred gallons an hour. Thirteen hundred thirty horsepower cruise, and it was indicating so, two hundred fifty knots across the ground. Yeah, we were running two sixty sometimes across the ground. Yeah. We were burning four hundred to four twenty an hour. 
Uh, total, all four. Total. Total. Oh, all four yeah. 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 Well, you, it, it's good to have all four. Not yeah. absolutely necessary, uh, but uh, it's good <laughs> to burn 400 <laughs> gallons got an hour. 50 gallon oil tanks, too, so it can stay up. Yeah. Actually, I've seen a video where they've shut down three engines and it'll fly on one engine. Oh. Yeah. yeah it's in YouTube. Uh, Arthur Godfrey is talking about the Super Connie, the most safest uh, airliner in the world and he, uh, he goes watch this it's like okay here it comes. i hate it when they say watch this yeah i know it's like yeah <laughs> well i guarantee you they didn't have very much fuel on board yeah i guarantee you. Know, yeah. they, 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 they probably did probably, it right over edwards air force base too <laughs> yeah they had they had places to land yeah, right, if, yeah. if they needed to so uh uh rod any closing comments i oh, just want to thank the crew the the guys that aren't here that was a good point uh, they're obviously working the hardest we're over here kind of relaxing for the day anyway so uh, but we'll get right back over there in the morning and and join them want to thank them thank you for inviting us and uh having us here and uh, you guys have anything to add just like i say we got some um, famous people in the audience and i yeah. thank you for all you guys do and thanks for for you know. sure yeah and we're going to get the Connie <laughs> here tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And, and Stuart, is the pilot? Is there anything I've missed that you think people would be interested in knowing about the airplane? They just need to come look at this thing. It's yeah. it's really impressive. Yeah. It is really impressive. If you like airplanes and you don't like the Connie, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Well, I mean, who wouldn't like a Connie? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, you led me into that. That was not planned. <laughs> Uh, guys, I, Rod, Steve, Stu, uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, it's been my honor, and I thank you uh, for all of you being here late afternoon looking into the sun. But uh, thank you guys so much. This is going to be really special to uh, see you come in tomorrow. You have to let us know uh, what time you're coming, okay? We'll okay, one more thing. I want to thank my wife for letting me do Karen. this. Thanks, honey. <laughs> Karen. <laughs> Uh, she's always patting me on the back. As long as I come home happy, she's happy. Yeah, it was really her dad that's responsible Absolutely. for that's most right. of this, right? Yeah. Uh, so Aviation also... wives are really understanding. Well, the first time we left the Chino Pattern and we went to, we were buzzed uh, Santa Maria Airport. I don't see Chris. He was here a minute ago. But on the way back, it just slapped Don me, or I said Don on me, I slapped myself in the face because I'm just, I got a tear in my eye thinking about Ed because... You know, I almost argued with him. We don't need this thing. You know, it's like, but here we go. Thanks, Ed. He knew better than me he, for sure. He knew more than you did. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, yes. Well, to all the uh, the crew chiefs and the wives, and, and I, I often think, you know, of course, you know, I fly airplanes, so I'm just a little, little odd here myself. But for the women who support um, what our passion <clears throat> is, and they don't always know all the terms that you're throwing out there and the enthusiasm that you get to go fly an airplane. But th those ladies are very special. Uh, and so my hat's off to all of you. And April's up there also. So uh, thank you. And uh, gentlemen, we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. North American Trainer Association, or NATA, is known for bringing warbirds together in a stunning showcase that celebrates human ingenuity and opens the world of military aircraft to future generations.
It's the future generations that hold the power of these great birds in their hands, much like NATA member Garrett Fleischman. You're not just flying in the moment. You're flying with a whole bunch of history on your shoulders, and it really means a lot to fly them. Bridging history and the future, NATA supports those who remember when and future generations through clinics, scholarships, social media, and a world-class magazine. NATA is a resource for the entire warbird community, and it's open to anyone. Membership can get you access to history in a way you've never experienced before, on the ground and in the air. Without NATA's help through scholarships and regional clinics, the best and the brightest of aviation's future wouldn't have the opportunities they need to soar. I myself do not own a T-6, I don't have the resources to fly in big formation flights on my own, but joining an organization like NADA allows me to do this just because I'm motivated and eager to learn. The scholarships for future Warbird a and mechanics is a start, but it's the clinics that keep everyone up to date and provide the necessary training and type club support. And to keep the momentum going, there will be even more regional clinics and events in the future. These regional clinics offer an opportunity like no other to learn about flying warbirds in formation and to become a better pilot. We all share the same interest of being a better pilot, being a safer pilot, being a uh, better formation pilot. join this organization and it's a constant learning process and and that's another thing that I love about it because a good pilot is always learning always net a membership isn't just for pilots it's for everyone who loves aviation past present and future we have a lot of members that are not uh, they're not even pilots. They love the fact that uh, the, uh, the airplanes still fly and they share the enthusiasm and the pride that's going on. It's a place where history comes to life, where the future is sparked by imagination and where aviation is more than just wings in the air. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. What else is it for? I was asked, you know, uh, where do I see NADA going into the future? And uh, I see uh, nowhere but up. Be a part of it. Join NADA today. I guess I was fairly apprehensive the whole time that I was flying in combat. And, and I guess there's good reason to feel that way. I'm there to cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm, and therefore they would like to damage me. And I was 25 years old at that time. Top Gun was really a thrill. I must have done well in actual combat because at the time I was just a lieutenant junior grade, which is a, a first lieutenant in the Air Force. And so I may have been the very first lieutenant junior grade to go through Top Gun.
That was the dream of a lifetime come true. I had wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot, just like my dad from the time I was 10 years old. STS-27 was my, was my third launch, and it was only the second launch after the Challenger accident. Well, I will never forget, we maneuvered the arm, and Mike Mullane was my arm operator, so he moved the arm over there, and we brought up the television image of the right wing, and I looked at what I was seeing, and I said to myself, we are going to die. To be an airline pilot, there was mandatory age 60 retirement. I was a NASA astronaut until I was 50 years old. And so I looked at the situation and I had known a number of Southwest airline pilots. And they were just like me. They were flying because they loved to fly. Well, there's a lot of piloting that goes into it, a tremendous amount of piloting that goes into it, because you're going to wind up passing other airplanes. You're, you're going to get in a duel with another airplane that's fairly closely matched. So there's a ton of satisfaction from, from doing that. And hey, let's just talk about the racing itself. It's fun to fly low, but it's dangerous. <laughs>